Section 5.2 is more about graphing rational functions, but maybe ones that aren't just transformations of 1 over x or 1 over x squared. So things are a little bit different. These definitions just kind of repeat from the last section. They're cleaned up a little bit, but that's what vertical and horizontal asymptotes were in section 5.1, and that's what they are now. So let's see, how are we going to find these? Well, first of all, it's helpful if you can write this in lowest terms. So that just means if you have some kind of common factor between the numerator and denominator, then you would factor that out, essentially. Um, that in and of itself is another thing that's going to show up. Um, that's where you get a hole in the graph, which it's actually mentioned down here. But we'll get to that in a little bit if you do have something you, that you can cancel out between the numerator and denominator. That's where you get the hole. But the, th the other thing that's important as far as the graphing goes is a function's never going to intersect a vertical asymptote because in order to have a vertical asymptote, the function has to be undefined there. So if the function is not defined, it can't possibly intersect that vertical line. And then the other thing is it might intersect a horizontal asymptote. It doesn't have to, right? Because that didn't happen with 1 over x or 1 over x squared or any of those transformations in the last section, but it can. And we'll see it. So we'll see both. I guess we'll see ones where it doesn't happen and ones where it does. All right, so the next thing is, well, how do you find these things? So first off, how do you find a vertical asymptote? Well, if you write the function in lowest terms, then just it's whatever would make the denominator zero, right? Anywhere where the function would be undefined. You would go for those values, figure them out, and that's where you're going to have your vertical asymptote or vertical asymptotes. You can actually have more than one. Even though we only had the one at a time in the last section, you can't have more than one. And then the other way to do it is if you don't have the function reduced in the lowest terms, figure out the values that are going to make the denominator equal to zero, but that don't also make the numerator equal to zero. Because anything that gives you zero over zero, that's where you get the whole. Um, and that's also where you'd have a common factor that you could factor out. Um, the whole, when we actually get to the graphing of those, it seems like that would make things more complicated, but actually it doesn't. You tend to get simpler looking shapes when you have the whole. So it's not an unwelcome thing to have one show up and it doesn't really make things more complicated. So that's nice. But then let's see, a few examples for finding vertical asymptotes. All right, so this first one, clearly this is in lowest terms, right? You couldn't possibly factor that numerator or that denominator. So you want the value of x that will make the denominator equal to 0. Okay, well, it's negative 2, right? You can set x plus 2 equal to 0. You solve that, you get x equals negative 2. So that's where the vertical asymptote is. However, you can have more than 1. And in number 2, that, the x squared minus 5x plus 4 in the denominator, factors. And if you factor that, there are two ways to get this expression here to be zero. If x is four or if x is one, so those are both going to be vertical asymptotes. So you can have multiple vertical asymptotes. There's nothing wrong with that. You could also have no vertical asymptotes, which is what happens in number three, because if you look at this denominator, there is no way for that to be zero, right? There's no way it could be less than one. So if you tried to solve it, you're going to get x squared equals negative 1, which has no real solutions. And since we're graphing stuff, we're just dealing with real numbers, then no real solutions, no vertical asymptotes. You can have that. Um, we'll see it when we have one of the long, full-fledged examples in a little bit. Those graphs tend to look a little weirder, but that's all right. Number four. Both of these factor, the numerator and denominator. So if you factor them, there is a common factor of x minus 3. So those would cancel, but then this is the way that you want to write it. So I've got it written as essentially what's left, the x plus 3 over x plus 7. But also you can't have x be 3 because back here in the original way the function was written out, 3 causes problems. If you sub in 3 for x, you're going to get 0 over 0. So you got to make sure you leave that in here. Also because... Whatever you end up factoring out, that's where you get the hole. So if we were going to do the full-fledged graph, we need this piece of information because we need to know where the hole is located. So this line here, I just sort of cleaned everything up for um, rewriting the function in lowest terms. But then the vertical asymptote is going to be negative 7 because that's what makes the denominator 0. 
but also you get a hole at x equals 3, right, at the thing that we were able to factor out. So that is a thing that you have to worry about. It's easy to forget about the hole, and the way to remember it is just to write in this extra piece in the end. Next, how do you find a horizontal asymptote? Okay, there are a couple of things first off. As we saw toward the end of the last page, you can have multiple vertical asymptotes for a single function. You can't have multiple horizontal asymptotes. And sometimes you can have one at all. Sometimes you have this, a slant or oblique asymptote. Our book calls those oblique. I call them slant, but they're the same thing. And what will happen is you won't get multiples of these. You either have one horizontal asymptote, one slant asymptote, or neither. So how do you figure out what you've got? Well, it depends on the degree of the numerator and denominator, actually. And these are the long ways of doing it. We'll have a better way, I don't know, in 10 minutes. But for right now, this is what we got. So one way you could do it is divide the numerator and denominator by the variable of greatest degree in the function. And what that means, like down here, it's just the largest power of x. So like down here, that's an x squared. You divide every term by x squared. And that's actually what's happening down here. So we're going to get to it in a minute. The other option is that you could do long division. And there should be an x to the left of that arrow. I don't know why I, I deleted that. It must have happened by accident. Um, and one nice thing with doing that is if you do the long division, and that's what you're going to have to do if you're in a slant asymptote situation. you got to do the long division there. And you'll know when you're in a slant asymptote situation. They're easy to catch. Um, but a proper rational expression is one where the degree of the numerator is less than the degree of the denominator. And anything like that will automatically approach zero as x approaches positive or negative infinity. So if you have a remainder, you don't have to worry about it because the remainder by itself will approach zero. It's not going to affect anything. So that's nice, especially because that actually does come up quite a bit. So that ends up being a really useful thing. All right, number one, we want to get the horizontal or slant asymptote here. Okay, well, the largest power of x was x squared. So I did it that way first, then the long division is going to come after. So if you divide every term by x squared, then we said anything that's a proper rational expression is going to zero as x approaches positive or negative infinity. All right, well then that's going to zero, that's going to zero, right? Because that's 12 times x to the zero in the numerator. So to degree the denominator is bigger. That's going to zero and that's going to zero. That one's a four. So that's the only one that's not going to zero. And you can see them over here, zero, zero, four, zero, zero. So zero divided by four is zero. So the horizontal asymptote is y equals zero, even though we already said, you know, any proper rational expression automatically is going to approach zero. This entire thing here is a proper rational expression, right? The degree of the denominator is two, the degree of the numerator is one. So you don't even really have to do this work, but I wanted to kind of go through these the long way at first. So long division, if you were going to do it that way, f is a proper rational expression. So if you try to divide, you end up with 0 plus f of x, which is kind of weird. Um, so like the division just doesn't go anywhere. You kind of just go around in a circle. But since f is a proper rational expression, it's going to approach 0 as x approaches positive or negative infinity. So automatically the horizontal asymptotes y equals 0. So in general, you can jump right to that. So if the degree of the numerator is less than the degree of the denominator, horizontal asymptote automatically y equals zero. Example number two. All right, so we could do it by dividing by the largest power of x, which is x squared. So you divide everything by x squared and you go, that's going to zero, that's going to zero, that's going to zero. That's an eight, that's a four. So as x approaches positive or negative infinity, f of x approaches eight fourths, which is two. All right, horizontal asymptote of y equals two this time. So what's different about this function? The degree, the numerator, and denominator are the same. Degree 2, degree 2. That's what's different between this one and number 1. Or, if you want to do it long division, I guess don't forget that 0x. And then 2 times 4x squared is going to give you the 8x squared, so you multiply the divisor by 2. You end up here, remainder of negative x plus 4. That means you could write f of x as 2 plus the remainder divided by our divisor, 4x squared minus 1. But this rational term here, that is a proper rational expression. So as x approaches positive or negative infinity, it approaches 0. 
So as x approaches positive infinity, f of x approaches 2 plus 0, which is 2. Okay, good. Same horizontal asymptote. Number three, um, if you look at this one, the thing that's different is now the degree of the numerator is bigger than the degree of the denominator. But not only is it bigger, it's bigger by one. The fact that it's bigger by one is the key. This is where you get a slant asymptote. And I know in theory I'm supposed to divide every term by x to the fourth because that's the biggest power of x that's in here. But if you do that, you get 3 over 0, and it's harder to see what's going on. So I intentionally used x cubed instead of x to the fourth here. For a slant asymptote, this method isn't going to work anyway. You've got to do the long division. So I figured this way, I don't know, it seemed like it was easier to, to get a handle on if I divided by x cubed. So there's nothing wrong with dividing by a lower power. You can do that. But if you divide by x cubed, then let's see. That's going to zero, that's going to zero, that's going to zero. That's a one. So it looks like f of x would approach 3x. But really, then you think, well, that's not just a value because then as x approaches positive infinity, then f of x is just 3x. That's also going to approach positive infinity. And then as x approaches negative infinity, f of x approaches negative infinity. These aren't numbers, right? Positive and negative infinity. So we're not really getting an asymptote right now. And if this is happening to you, what that means is that you're not getting a horizontal asymptote. You're getting something else. And in this particular situation where the degree of the numerator is one larger than the degree of the denominator, you get a slant asymptote. And the way that you have to get it is by long division. So that's what I'm doing here, right? Got to be careful, get those zero terms in there, right? The dividend didn't have an x cubed term. I got to put one um, put one in and then um, didn't have an x or yeah, I guess a constant on the end. Um, so I put them in too. And then the divisor, which would be on the bottom, right? That doesn't have an x term, so I had to put in a zero x. All right, well then 3x times x cubed would give you 3x to the fourth. You multiply this all out by 3x, you end up with this thing in parentheses. Subtract off, you get 3x cubed minus x squared minus 3x. Bring down the zero, because that's gonna have such a huge effect here. Then three times x cubed would give you the 3x cubed. So you get this whole thing in parentheses when you multiply the divisor by three. Subtract, you end up here. And so you could write f of x this way is 3x plus 3 plus remainder over the divisor. But this is a proper rational expression, so it's going to go to 0 as x goes to positive or negative infinity. So you can effectively just leave the remainder off. And what you get is that the asymptote is 3x plus 3, which is not a horizontal line. And this is why they're called slant asymptotes, because what do you get? And you go, well, this is a linear graph, right? Like it's, it's still a line. It's just not a flat one, right? It's got a slope to it. So that's why it's a slant asymptote because it's not a hor it's a line, but it's not a horizontal line, right? It's got a non-zero slope. So it's a little bit tougher to draw when you get these, but it's not too, too bad. And this is the situation where you get them, where the degree of the numerator is one larger than the degree of the denominator. The first half of this page is mostly just a summary of what to do as far as the horizontal or slant asymptotes go. So if the degree of the numerator is smaller than the degree of the denominator, automatically y equals zero, horizontal asymptote. If the degrees are equal, then the horizontal asymptotes, the ratio of the leading coefficients, like the one where we got the two, where we had the eight x squared and the four x squared, and really it's just eight divided by four. It's that idea. And then if the degree of the numerator is one larger than the degree of the denominator, you got the slant asymptote, get it by long division. But then the other option is what if the degree of the numerator is at least two more than the degree of the denominator? Then you get neither. You don't have a horizontal asymptote or a slant asymptote. You would still have an asymptote, but they get really wild looking. And this is sort of the, the cutoff for where maybe drawing things by hand isn't the best way to go. Uh, those, are t those are tough to draw by hand when you get above a difference of two between the degree of numerator and denominator. All right, so how do you graph a rational function? There are a lot of steps here. First, put it in the lowest terms. If nothing else, that'll tell you where you've got a hole. 
if you've got a hole. Then see if you got any vertical asymptotes, see if you got any holes. Then horizontal or slant asymptote or neither, right? These are the things that we were just talking about. The X and Y intercepts, those, those usually aren't too bad to get, especially the Y intercept. That's usually really easy. Then if there is a horizontal or slant asymptote, you wanna figure out if the function intersects it because that's a possibility. Sometimes it happens, sometimes it doesn't. Then number five is actually most of the work, figuring out where the graph is above or below the x-axis, where basically you just have to split the x-axis into intervals and pick values out of each interval. A lot of times you get to recycle stuff, like you can probably recycle the y-intercept because you'll already know what it is, and if zero is in one of those intervals, then you can just go ahead and reuse it. So that's nice. And then when you make the graph, I would say put the asymptotes in first, then points and holes that you found, and then just kind of connect everything together from there. There is an optional step of looking to see if you have an even or an odd function. I personally do not worry about that because with these, it's rare to get something that's even or odd. Usually they don't look that nice. So I don't even worry about this down here at all. First example of doing a whole big long setup for getting a graph, we've got this as our function, which is already in lowest terms. So you can factor the denominator, but that doesn't give you anything you can cancel. All right, so that means there are no holes. But we can also pretty easily see what the vertical asymptotes are right, it's the values that would make the denominator zero. So for x minus four times x plus three to be zero, either x is four or x is equal to negative three. So those are the vertical asymptotes. Horizontal asymptote, if you look up here, the degree of the denominator is two, the degree of the numerator is one. So this is a situation where automatically the horizontal asymptotes y equals zero. So getting the asymptotes really doesn't take that long, usually. Uh, but then the y-intercept and the x-intercept and seeing if there's a point where the graph is going to intersect the horizontal asymptote. So the y-intercept is just going to be f of 0, but that would be negative 3 over negative 12, which is 1 fourth. Okay. Then for the x-intercept, set the numerator equal to 0 and then solve that. And what you end up with is 3 halves or 1 and a half. I wrote that as a mixed number for graphing purposes. I think that's easier to graph. Um, here you don't have to check to see if the, um, if the function is going to intersect the horizontal asymptote because we just did that. When the horizontal asymptote is y equals zero, then the x-intercept, if you've got one, is where the function intersects the horizontal asymptote. So you don't have to do a separate step here. Later you do in some of the other examples. Let's see, then the way you break up the x-axis here into intervals is you use whatever would make the numerator or denominator zero. So negative three and four make the denominator zero. One and a half, which is in between these two, makes the numerator zero. So I just said, okay, I've got those three numbers, I'm gonna put them in order, and then we gotta check all four of these intervals. Well, we really only have to check three of them because between negative three and one and a half, you could pick zero, and we already know what that is. It's one fourth, that's the y-intercept. So there you get to recycle a little bit. But then the other three, you got to pick stuff. So if you substitute in negative four for this interval out here, you end up with negative 11 eighths or negative one and three eighths for graphing purposes. So negative down there. Between one and a half and four, I pick two. F of two ends up being negative one tenth. Okay, well that's negative in between those two. And then for above four, I picked five. And if you sub in five, you get seven eighths. So then in order to make the graph, so the asymptotes are actually supposed to be a different color and that didn't quite come out, but here's the vertical asymptote of x equals negative three. Then I put in the other vertical asymptote of x equals four. Then I put in the horizontal asymptote of y equals zero. So right along the axis. Then after that, there's no hole to worry about. So we can just start plotting the points that we've collected. So we know that the y-intercept is one fourth, there's that. And we know the x-intercept is one and a half. There's that right there. Then the other points, uh, four, or, or rather negative four, negative one and three eighths is there. 
Then we have two negative one tenth, which is there. And then we have five seven eighths, which is there. So we know where the graph is gonna intersect the horizontal asymptote y equals zero. That's not gonna happen anywhere else, which means that on the end, so like this piece on the left and this piece on the right, they're gonna be confined by those asymptotes. So this piece over here, it's gonna be stuck up here because we know that one point is on it. So what the graph is gonna look like is it's gonna approach the horizontal asymptote down there, it's gonna approach the vertical asymptote up here. Same sort of logic over here, we've got this one point up here, and we go, okay, so it must be up here where it's you know, sort of squeezed in by these two asymptotes, so approaching the horizontal one that way, vertical one that way. And then in between, we have those three points. So just because of the way those are arranged, where like this one's above the axis, this one's below, it must be that the function approaches x equals negative three this way going up, and it must approach x equals four going down. If they didn't work that way, then there would be more x-intercepts. So since we don't have those, that must be the way that this is set up. So there are a lot of moving parts into getting these graphs, but that's basically what you would have to do for one of these. The second example, if you're looking at this one and thinking, wait, we had things like that in 5.1, couldn't you just divide, like do long division, and then it would be transformations on the graph of one over X? You could do that, but this wouldn't be the best place to do it. I mean, looking at this, you can tell if you were gonna to try to do it that way, you'd have a horizontal shift of two to the left. But if you do the long division, you're going to end up with, let's see, a stretch, like a vertical stretch of seven, and you're also gonna have a reflection. So that stretch of seven, that's tough to graph. So it might be easier just to do this one this way, actually, of getting the asymptotes and, and everything and just seeing where it's above or below the axis. So this is already in lowest terms, right? There's nothing to even factor, so therefore there's no way we're getting a common factor. So the only vertical asymptote is going to be x equals negative 2, right? That's what would make the denominator 0. No holes because there's nothing to cancel out. Horizontal asymptote here is 1 because the degree of the numerator and denominator are the same. They're both 1. So the ratio of the leading coefficients, this is 1x, this is 1x. So 1 divided by 1 is 1. And then to check to see if the graph of f is going to intersect the line y equals 1, you just have to set f of x equal to one. So there's f of x. If I clear fractions, so multiply both sides by x plus two, I'm gonna end up here. That's not solvable. Because for this to be true, you'd need negative five to be equal to two, and that clearly does not work. So f of x does not intersect the horizontal asymptote. All right, good to know. We'll take that into account when we're making the graph in a couple of minutes. Next thing, step four is the intercepts. So the y-intercept, Subbing in zeros for x, you're gonna get negative five over two. So that's negative two and a half as a mixed number for graphing purposes. Then for the x-intercept, set the numerator equal to zero. So x minus five equals zero, so that means x is five. Okay, there's the x-intercept. Next is where is the graph above or below the axis? So the numbers that you need to break up the number line are whatever would make the numerator zero and whatever would make the denominator zero. So five makes the numerator zero, Negative two makes the denominator zero. And that's all you really need here. You just gotta check these three intervals. We already did the one in the middle because we know what the y-intercept is, right? Zero is between negative two and five. So okay, negative five halves, that's negative, all right? Out here, for less than negative two, I pick negative three. You sub in negative three, you get eight, positive. I also picked negative four because I thought negative three, eight might be tough to graph. You can see it, it's that point right there. So I picked another one just to get a better feel for how to make the graph. You don't have to do this piece, but I did it just so I wouldn't end up with a hideous thing over here. And if you put in a negative four, if you sub that in for X, you're gonna get four and a half. All right, that one seems like it's easier to graph. And then for values bigger than five, I picked six and F of six is one eighth. Okay, going down here. Vertical asymptote was x equals negative two, there's that. Horizontal asymptotes y equals one, there's that. No hole, 
So go right to plotting points. There's our y-intercept of negative 2.5. Then there's our x-intercept of 5. Other than that, we have negative 3, 8, which is up there. We have negative 4, 4.5, which is right there. And we have 6, 1 eighth, which is that one right there. Okay, we also know that the graph is never going to touch the horizontal asymptote, which means if we got these points up here, then this graph has to be contained by the asymptotes right there. So we just have to draw it so it's approaching the vertical asymptote up there and the horizontal asymptote down there. Same thing here, it's going to be confined by these asymptotes like so. So with those three points, you would say, okay, well then here it must be approaching the horizontal asymptote, and then down here it's approaching the vertical asymptote. And there's the graph of example number two. Example number three. The thing that's noteworthy, look at the degrees. Degree two in the numerator, degree one in the denominator. Degree of the numerator is one larger than the degree of the denominator, so we're actually gonna get a slant asymptote this time. That's what's special about this example. So the first thing is, well, can you factor anything out? Nope. You can factor the numerator, but you can't factor anything out. And might as well factor the numerator anyway, right? It helps to get the x-intercepts later. But this is already in lowest terms, so there won't be any holes. You do get one vertical asymptote when x equals 2. And we do get a slant asymptote, so you've got to get it by long division. So I'm dividing the numerator by the denominator. So x times x would give you that x squared, right? So you multiply that through, you get x squared minus 2x. Subtract, then minus 5 plus 2 is minus 3. So minus 3x plus 4. Minus 3 times x will give you the minus 3x. And then you end up with a remainder of 2. But you can basically disregard the remainder when you're getting a slant asymptote because um, negative 2 over x minus 2 is a proper rational function, so it's going to approach 0. So our slant asymptote is y equals x minus 3. So we're going to have to graph that one, and we're going to have this instead of having a horizontal asymptote. Next thing is, well, is our function going to intersect the slant asymptote? We'll just have to set the function equal to x minus 3. So there's our function. And if I'm going to clear fractions and multiply both sides by x minus 2, then you just get the numerator on the left, but x minus 3 times x minus 2 is going to give you this, the x squared minus 5x plus 6. But for those two to be equal, then 4 would have to be equal to 6, which is not true, so there's no intersection. f is not going to intersect our slant asymptote here. All right, next, the y-intercept, f of 0. It's going to be 4 over negative 2, so that's just negative 2. The x-intercept, if you set the numerator equal to 0, we already factored it, so this tumbles right out. Either x equals 4 or x equals 1 to make that 0, so we've got two x-intercepts this time. Then we're going to break up the number line into what makes the numerator 0 or what makes the denominator 0. That's what we're going to use as cut points. So the 1 and 4 make the numerator 0, the 2 makes the denominator 0, so you just put them in order. And then we already have the one on the left because f of 0 is negative 2. We already got that y-intercept. For between 1 and 2, sadly, for once, we're going to have to pick a fraction, so I picked 3 halves. I figured that was the simplest one in between 1 and 2. So f of 3 halves ends up being 5 halves, or 2 and a half for graphing purposes. Then between 2 and 4, I pick 3. So f of 3 ends up being negative 2. And then for bigger than 4, I pick 5. And f of 5 ends up being 4 thirds, or 1 and 1 third. And now we got things to plot. Vertical asymptote is x equals 2, so there's that. Then the slant asymptote, basically what I did here, and you can kind of tell, I put in little x's for what I was going to have to draw through, and for y equals x minus 3, I just got the x-intercept and y-intercept and drew in the dotted line that goes through them because you only need two points to determine a line, right? And I figured those were the easiest two that I could come up with. So I just got the two intercepts and I said, okay, it's going through those. So I just drew the dotted line that goes through those. So there's the slant asymptote. Then our points, let's see, we had the y-intercept of negative two, which is right there. Two x-intercepts, one, which is there, four, which is there. Then other points, we had f of three halves is two and a half. So three halves over two and a half up is that one right there. Um, f of 3 is negative 2. That's this point. 
and then f of 5 is 1 and a third, that's this point. Okay, and we know that the graph does not intersect the slant asymptote. So with these three points over here, they're going to be confined by this vertical asymptote and the slant one going this way. So I just drew in the function. So it's approaching the vertical asymptote and approaching the slant asymptote. Same thing over here. Though with these three points here, it's going to be confined by the slant here and then the vertical there. So approaching the slant going up that way and then going down this way, approaching the vertical asymptote. So they look a little bit different when you have the slant asymptote, but it's doable, right? So it's not so bad. It is different, right? And it, it does take maybe doing a couple of these to sort of get used to it, but it's really not too bad. Example number four. This one's kind of an oddball because there's not going to be a vertical asymptote. There's no way to get that denominator to be zero. That gives you something that looks a little unusual when you make the graph. And you'll see it when we get down there. But, I mean, you can factor the numerator, but you're not going to be able to factor anything out because you can't factor that denominator. So no holes, no vertical asymptote because there's no way to get the denominator to be zero. The horizontal asymptote is going to be one because... We've got the same degree in the numerator and denominator, both degree two. And you can say, well, that's a 1x squared. That's also a 1x squared. So y is 1 over 1, which is 1. Then do you get an intersection? This time you do. So if we set the function equal to 1, so there's f of x. If you clear fractions, you get this. So in order for this equality to hold up, you'd need 2x minus 3 to be equal to 1. But there's an x value where that actually happens when x is 2. Okay, well then what that tells us is that 2, 1 must be a point on the graph, right? The y-coordinate's got to be 1 because this is where the graph intersects the line y equals 1. So there is an intersection with the horizontal asymptote this time. That makes that part of the graph kind of interesting, and it's a little tough to draw. You'll see, you'll see why when we get, to, get down to it. It'll be in a couple of minutes. All right, let's see. Next thing is intercepts. So the y-intercept, f of 0 is going to be negative 3 over 1. Well, that's negative 3. x-intercepts, if you set the numerator equal to 0, which we've already got factored up in step 1, then, well, x equals negative 3, x equals 1. Those are both vertical asymptotes. And then in order to see where the function's positive or negative, we're just going to need the values that make the numerator or denominator zero. Well, nothing makes the denominator zero this time, but negative three and one both make the numerator zero. So that's what we're going to use to break up the number line. We already got the middle because we know f of zero is negative three. And we already got the right side because it's over here, right? It's where the graph intersects the horizontal asymptote. We already know f of two is one, so that's positive. We actually only have to check one interval, this one over here on the left. So we need something less than negative 3. I picked negative 4. And if you sub in negative 4 into f, you're going to get 5 seventeenths, which is a positive number. All right. Making the graph. No vertical asymptote. we got a horizontal asymptote of y equals 1. And then the other points you'd be putting in, let's see, y-intercept of negative 3. We had x-intercepts of negative 3 and 1. Then we know that 2, 1 is a point on the graph. We know that negative 4, 5 seventeenths, which is what that's supposed to be. That's also a point on the graph. And then we're going to draw this thing out. It's going to be all one single piece because there's no vertical asymptote. But... The graph is only going to cross or touch the horizontal asymptote in one spot. So what does that mean? Well, then that means on the left, we know that's not going to happen. So the graph is just going to come up and approach the asymptote but never touch it. On the right, it's going to cross right here. So it's got to cross there, and it's going to go up above, but then it's still going to approach it as you go out farther toward the right. So it's got to go up a little bit and then come back down and approach the asymptote from above. So that's a little bit different, right? And even just looking at the shape of this thing, you go, wow, that, that looks weird. That's a weird looking graph. But it's a couple of things playing into it. It's that there's no vertical asymptote, but there is the um, intersection of F with the horizontal asymptote. But yeah, it's kind of a different looking shape with this one. 
Um, but they can happen, and I wanted to get every case in here, so I had to get one of these in here with no vertical asymptote. Last example, I guess there's not a whole lot of suspense here if everything has to show up in one of these. The thing that hasn't shown up yet is having a hole in the graph. So that is what happens here. You can factor the numerator and denominator, and they've got a common factor. All right, so here they are factored. Both of them have x minus 2 as a factor, so you could rewrite f of x this way as 3x plus 1 over x plus 2, but also x can't be 2, because at 2, that's where you get the hole. All right. So we'll worry about the hole in a second. First of all, if you're in lowest terms, you look at that, you go, all right, x equals negative 2. That's the vertical asymptote. Yes, it is. How do you figure out what the hole is? Because we know what its x-coordinate is. We know its x-coordinate's 2. How do you get the y-coordinate of the hole? Well, basically what you do is you sub the 2 into the simplified version of the function, so the one that's reduced in the lowest terms. And that's what I did here. So 3 times 2 plus 1 over 2 plus 2. That's what that is. It's putting 2 into this thing right here. And you get 7 fourths or 1 and 3 fourths for graphing purposes. So that's where the hole's going to be. It's the point 2 7 fourths or 2 1 and 3 fourths. And the way that you draw it is you just draw an open circle. Right? That's what a hole would look like in a graph. And I guess we'll get there in a minute when we get down to the graph. But then the horizontal asymptote, which is what we're going to have here, degree of the numerator and denominator, both 2. So yeah, that's going to be a horizontal asymptote situation, not a slant asymptote situation. And it's going to be the ratio of the leading coefficients. So 3 over 1, that's 3. All right, the y-intercept, it's 1 half because you could get it, I guess, from this reduced version, right? If you subbed in zeros for x, you're going to get 1 over 2. Or you could get it from this one, too. You'd get negative 2 over negative 4. That's also 1 half. Then for the x-intercept, just set the numerator of the reduced version equal to 0. So if 3x plus 1 equals 0, x must be negative 1 third. All right, then breaking up the number line, we just need the values that make the numerator or denominator of the reduced version equal to 0. So negative 1 third makes the numerator 0, and then negative 2 makes the denominator 0. We already have the, let's see, we have the part on, on the left, or on the right, rather. I'm pointing at the right thing, but saying the wrong word. Right, this is where 0 is. It's bigger than negative 1 third. So, yeah, we already know this. F of 0 is 1 half. That's positive. We got this one already. Other than that, let's see. Here we've got, um, I guess in between, I would pick negative 1. So F of negative 1 is negative 2. Okay, yeah, that's negative. Then f of negative 3 for this interval out here, you end up with 8. So that's way up off the graph, which is why I picked another one. That's why I got the um, f of negative 4 as 5 halves, just to get another point to make the drawing easier. Again, that's, that's more or less just for me. Um, I guess I left a step off here, actually, which is to check to make sure that, uh, or to see if there's an intersection. There actually isn't, because... If you set 3x plus 1 over x plus 2 equal to 3, you'd have 3x plus 1 equal to 3x plus 6. So the graph isn't going to intersect the horizontal asymptote here. Um, but that one, I guess I did forget to put that in, and I'll have to fix that. But let's see. So if we're going to graph this thing, I guess you would put the asymptotes in first. So vertical asymptote of x equals negative 2, horizontal asymptote of y equals 3. Then I would go next and put in the hole. We know where it is, right? It's 2, 1, 3 fourths. So look at what it looks like. It's just an open circle, right? That's what a hole looks like in a graph. Other than that, let's see. I messed up here and accidentally put negative 1 half instead of positive 1 half for the y-intercept. That's why it says ignore. Um, I just screwed that part up. The x-intercept is negative 1 third. That's right there. Other points, f of negative 1 is negative 2, that's right there. Then f of negative 3 is 8, that's the one that's way up there. And then f of negative 4 is 5 halves is right there. Then we just have to draw in the two pieces of the graph. So this part, I guess, is conventional, right? We just got our two points, we got our asymptotes. So yeah, it's just going to approach the asymptotes, um, Right down here approaching the horizontal, up here approaching the vertical. The way that you would draw this one with the hole in it, 
you almost just treat the hole like it's a point. At least for drawing in the graph you do. Right? So you go, all right, we got that hole, point, point, point. So it must be approaching the horizontal asymptote that way and the vertical asymptote that way. And you just draw it in like that. So when you have the hole, that doesn't really affect the drawing part too much at the end. It's just that when you have a hole, in order to make sure that that's visible in the graph, just make sure you have an open circle.